Bon dia, familia de igreja. It's great to see you all. And if you are only an English-speaking person, I just swore at you, don't worry. Um, you know, <laughs> it is good to see all of you this morning. And we are here to worship the Lord, to sing His praises, to give glory to His name. Let me share with you the call to worship this morning found in Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. It says, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is to be exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel, your God. And we want to worship him this morning. Let's pray. Father, we invite you into this place, for we have come seeking after you, hungering for more of you. And we pray, O oh God, that you would speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, as we worship, that you would be glorified and lifted up, O oh God. We pray, Father, that you would teach us and show us and God, most of all this morning, we want and need an encounter with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we invite you to stand, let's worship the Lord together.
want to receive our morning offering. I'm just looking for where the ushers are. <laughs> there we go. We're getting a couple of them. We're going to receive our morning offering. Just a reminder that uh, the, the last Sunday of the month, we will also be taking our alabaster offering and uh, to, uh, for the work, for buildings, for hospitals, schools, uh, the work of uh, missions around the world. That'll be the last Sunday of this month. Well, let's uh, pray for our morning offering. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to come. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give, for you are our example. You have given so much to us. And we ask, oh God, now that you would bless this offering. We pray, Lord, you would touch lives and renew hearts with it, Father. And we ask, oh God, a blessing upon those who give this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Bon dia. Did you know that the Bethany Church of the Nazarene, our church here, is involved in so many ministries, local, overseas, across the nations. In fact, the Nazarene Church, the broader church, is present in 164 countries, making Christ-like disciples in the nations, also compassion ministries, work a witness, and many, and many, many more uh, ministries. As you can see here, this is just our local church here, Bethany Church. Is involved in all these ministries in here, as you can read it. Uh, some of them are through monetary um, offerings, and others are just like uh, you, hands-on. Doesn't need the, mon the, uh, the offering, but just hands-on, as you can see on those ministries there. So if you'd like to be part of any of these ministries here, let us know. Talk to pastor, talk to one of the board uh, leaders, and uh, we'll help you, uh, but be involved. Now, um, this, can you help me? Is there any one of these boards here that shows the word alabaster? Is that, which one is this? One, two, three, or four? Three? Sarah is holding alabaster <laughs> offering. Nice. So this month, as Pastor mentioned, on the last day, uh, the last Sunday of the month, the 24th, We'll be collecting our offering, alabaster offering. So it's an opportunity for you to go in your car. You know, like uh, we got so many coins and we put on that little container, getting dust is in there. Hey, take opportunity to clean that and bring it and put in your alabaster offering. Or sometimes you uh, come from work and you empty your pockets, all those quarters, $10 bills, $100 bills. I mean, God takes $100 bills, right? Absolutely. Uh, there you go. I mean, even that, God take that. So that's a good opportunity. So take, uh, so last Sunday of the month, the 24th, we'll be collecting our alabaster offering. I have one more announcement. Thank you, guys. You may walk back. Thank you, you guys. All saw the ministries. So as they walk in, I just want to say that one of the ministries that was showing there was Vida Ministry. This coming Saturday, right here on our parking lot, they're going to have a car wash where they raise funds for, for the ministry. So it's going to be between 9 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. If you need to wash your car, they're going to be doing the, the car wash right here in the parking lot. They will charge uh, between $7 to $15, depending on what you want them to do it. But this coming Saturday, car wash down here on our parking lot. Uh, I will need some people from the church if you guys want to help with uh, uh, feeding the people. They're going to be buying, I think, pizza for, for the workers, but they need some hands to, to, uh, to feed them because all the teens from different churches are going to be doing the hard work. So if you want to help, just let me know. Talk to me. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Would you please stand for the doxology?
Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the
our children are dismissed at this time for Children's Church. And our altar is open for a time of prayer. You're welcome to come forward as we sing this song. Father, this morning we want to thank you. We want to thank you that we can turn to you and that you offer grace, mercy, peace. God, that you can do abundantly above all we ask or imagine. And Lord, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that we can bring our request to you, our concerns, our burdens, and that you provide rest. So we want to lift up each of these at the altar here this morning. God, as they pour their hearts out to you, would you come and meet their need? Would you minister to each one? Would you bless and encourage? Would you, Lord, provide? Would you heal and restore? Would you strengthen? Would you bring comfort and peace? God, where there are broken relationships, may you just mend and bring back together. Where there are lost loved ones, we pray, oh God, you would draw them to you. Whatever they need, Lord, would you work a miracle in their lives, in the lives of each one this morning who lifts up their voice to you. Lord, we, we pray for our world so much that is taking place. And God, we don't have all the answers, but we know you are the answer. So we do pray, oh God. We pray, Father, again, that you would cease that war in the Ukraine and that you would protect those precious people, Lord. Guide them, help them, supply their needs. For those, Lord, who have recently lost uh, things because of uh, uh, the weather, Lord, because of hurricanes, and we pray, oh, surround them with your love and care. 
God, we pray that you would help us as a church to reach out to our world, to reach out to our community, to be Jesus to those around us. Remind us of the great commission that you have given to us to go and to touch lives. God, we pray that your glory would be seen in all that we do. Lord, we lift up to you this morning and ask for you to speak to us now through your word. Teach us, show us, guide us, Father. Oh, God, we want to hear from you. And Lord, help us, help us to give you the glory, the honor, the praise. It all belongs to you, God. You are so good. And we celebrate that this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for what you are doing even right now. We thank you and give you glory. And Lord, we do pray uh, this morning for uh, just come for Rafina and the loss, Lord. We pray you minister to her today. Surrounded with your love and care, Father the whole family. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray all this. Amen. In this dream, you woke up in the morning of the New York City Marathon and someone had stolen your shoes? It was a nightmare. But then you woke up, you ran the marathon, and you won. No, we won. Me and my vapor fly 4%. Okay, see, it's statements like that that we need to work on. When was the last time you took them off? Why would I take them off? I like being fast. I like showering fast, walking the dog fast. I like fast service, fast shipping, fast elevators. Why would I ever take them off? Wait a second. Are you trying to steal my 4%? Am I early? Yes, you're early every week. Sorry, Doc. Hey, Shalane. Hey. What's up? What's up? Good to see you again. Shalane, I need you to be honest with me. Do you shower with your shoes on? Got to be the shoes. <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess about what we're talking about this morning? <laughs> we are on the uh, armor of God, spiritual warfare. This morning we are going to look at the feet fitted with the gospel of peace. That classic... Uh, Classic Nike commercial was intended to convince the buying public of the importance of having the right footwear, right? Well, guess what? So is Paul here in Ephesians. The importance of having the right footwear and speaking of footwear, and I don't know why this is cutting in and out, but uh, we'll keep it going here. Speaking of footwear, Right? Don't know if you know we have a, a uh, celebrity athlete among us here. This is uh, uh, Ricky. And um, so, uh, uh, and a number of us there in the, the middle went to uh, his uh, football game, the start of the season this past week, and uh, saw him. And I don't know if it's the shoes or not, but man, is he a fast runner. <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe it, right? Um, 
he'd leave me in the dust. So it, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so we will uh, be going to future games. We invite you to join us as a church, uh, just to celebrate uh, one of our own and uh, his incredible abilities and. Um, that picture in the middle, that's uh, Beth trying to explain the game of football to, to Jim, who was totally lost. Um, so, uh, you know. We... <laughs> ah. I know, as a pastor, I'm like, no, no, they're not supposed to do that. No. <laughs> uh, it was a fun time and uh, a great time together. But we want to talk this morning about being fitted with the proper shoes. Being fitted with the proper shoes, right? Having the right shoes is critical. And uh, we, uh, Paul, wanted to emphasize that. And again, remember, Paul was using these man, as, a, um, as an example to us about spiritual truths, right? He is chained to two Roman soldiers and he's using the example of the armor that the soldiers are wearing to talk about how God equips us for spiritual warfare, right? Equips us to stand firm. So Ephesians chapter six and verse 13 says this, Stand firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Stand firm with your feet fitted with the readiness right, that comes from the gospel of peace. The shoes of a Roman soldier were very important. Part of the armor. The soldiers were often had to march upwards of 30 miles a day. And so they needed good footwear, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't make it. They would or get to the end of the journey and wouldn't be able to enter the battle because they could not go any further. The, the shoes of the soldier were open-toed, okay? They, like a sandal. They were tied securely about the ankle. They were custom-fitted to each soldier. And there was a thick leather upper, the part that covered the shins, so that the, and the soles were extremely thick and durable. Because you can imagine back during the, the time of the Roman army, they didn't have paved roads like we have, right? Maybe they also didn't have potholes, I don't know, but they didn't have those paved roads so it was rough terrain that they had to march over. And so these, and in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the kind of battles that these foot soldiers engaged in, these, this footwear helped them to stand firm, right? to stand firm, to stand their ground. So in order to... Uh, to, to enable the soldiers to hold on to their ground and dig in, the Romans would uh, drive these nails into the bottom of the soles of the sandals. And these nails were called basically hobnails. And they, um, they were short, stubby nails that would stick out of the bottom of the shoe and dig into it Rain, whatever they came up against, they were able to stand. And you can begin to of um, my to uh, pulpit mic. Uh, I don't see Manny back there, so we'll wait till he comes. Back. Try to figure out why this is turning on and off. Um, so they, they were able to stand even because of these things. And you can see the connection here that Paul is trying to make. That God equips us to stand firm no matter what we are facing. And they could also, by the way, be used because 
um, if they if they would kick, guess where those nails are going to land, right? <laughs> so footwear was important. And that is why Paul says our feet should be fitted tightly bound with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Tightly bound. There are two key elements here. First, in regards to that, is that the gospel of peace, right? It says that we are to be fitted with the gospel of peace. And the second part of that, the second aspect of that, is that we are to be ready. Readiness. So, um, I think they switched, so I'll just take this off. The readiness of the gospel of peace. So we're going to look at those two aspects this morning, the gospel of peace and the readiness. So first of all, let's talk about the gospel of peace. The Greek word that is translated peace here is eraani, which which literally means has been bound together. It is the idea of two things that once were separated and against each other now being joined together, melded together in an unbreakable bond. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which means completeness, right? Wholeness, or to be at rest. I brought uh, this morning some of my own uh, kind of footwear, and one of the things that I wanted to show you um, these are my Sunday shoes. <laughs> we'll be taking up an offering after church for. <laughs> <laughs> this does not represent peace, does it? <laughs> See, because peace is bound together, right? Solid, unified, whole. This is not footwear of the gospel of peace, right? <laughs> and um, I've even tried to glue these, and it still doesn't quite work, right? But that's, it's important to recognize what Paul is saying here. The peace that we possess because of God, right? It's a piece of wholeness. It's a piece that binds us together, a completeness. And the term gospel is translated here, good news. So the good news of complete wholeness that God has created us to be. That's what we carry, right? the complete wholeness. Paul is talking about being fitted with the good news of a completeness and being joined together as one. There, there are kind of three aspects here to this gospel of peace that I want to talk to you about. The first one is this, is the peace with God. One of the things that we as Christians are armed with is peace with God, our creator. That's an important thing to know. By the work of Jesus Christ, we are bound with God, joined together. This is the good news of the gospel. We were God's enemies at war with God. We were separated from God, right? And we could do nothing about it. Because of our sin, Jesus Christ came to bring peace between us and God, to restore a relationship that we were originally created to have. Right? Intimacy with God. Now, now, maybe some of you might have a Christian life like this, but <laughs> that's not what we were created to be. We were created to have this close, intimate, 
personal relationship with God. And that is very possible because of Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We're standing in the right relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. And when we understand this reality, we can combat the attacks of Satan when he tries to tell us that we're not good enough, right, for God. When he tries to convince us that God would never accept us, right, or that our past is too too evil, too great for God. We can stand with confidence, right? We can refute those lies, digging in and saying, God and I are at peace. We are together, right? There's power in the truth of having peace with God. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19 says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, meaning Jesus, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether the things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. God made peace through Jesus. You once were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ physical body through his death to present you wholly in his sight, in God's sight, without blemish and free, free from accusation, right? That's it. The next time the devil lies to you and says, you're not worth it, you can't do it, God's embarrassed by you, say, no, 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 I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ, right? Secondly, we have the peace of God within us. The peace of God, when life presses in, when money is short and bills are long, when relationships are crumbling, and when we don't know if we can make it another day, we have peace of God within us, right? How in the world, in this crazy world, in this violent world, how can we live? We live because the peace of God is within us. We don't look at the circumstances. We look at Jesus, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? It's that deep-seated peace. It's not the promise of ease and comfort, right? It's not the promise of wealth. It's the promise in the middle of the storm, we can have peace, right? We can have peace. It's a confidence in God, that God is in control. The aspect of this peace is clearly described in Philippians chapter four. Paul, in prison, chained up, facing a death sentence, says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Right? You say, I don't, I don't know how I have this peace. Right, because scripture says you're not going to understand why you have this peace, but God will give you what you need, the peace. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, right? Now, I didn't see in that list, think about the economy. 
Think about whether there are wars or not going on. Think about whether there are hurricanes or not. You see, God can give us such a peace. We don't need to think about that stuff. We just need to center upon him, right? And it says, whatever you have learned or received or heard in me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The world can't understand it because it can't come up with it on its own. You know, the world has tried since the beginning of time for peace and it hasn't happened yet. So they don't understand that. Our peace comes from trusting God, resting in him. And the devil will try to tell you, it's not going to work. You're headed for a fall. But our peace comes not in our circumstances, but from the Lord. From the Lord. Dr. Odette yesterday was sharing her testimony about... um, about the time when her husband uh, was given a cancer diagnosis and, and, and died. And, and she said she prayed for a miracle. And she said the miracle came, but not the miracle of her husband not dying. The miracle of the peace of God in her. Right? Which transcends understanding. That's what we have. That's why we can face tomorrow. Well, the third part of this peace is a peace with others. A peace with others. On the cross, Jesus not only tore down the barriers that separated us from God, but he also destroyed the walls that separated us from each other. The gospel of peace has established an army of individual believers who are united under one head, Christ. And here's a definition of the church for you. The church is a group of people who are totally different from each other, different backgrounds, different actions, different thoughts, different attitudes, different locations, Different ways of doing things coming together with one focus, Jesus Christ. Right? What a miracle that is. Right? And one of the devil's most effective tools is to try to create barriers within the body of Christ. And to bring separation among its mem- the members of the body. Get us fighting. Get us to be prejudiced. Get us to have our own agendas. And this is the crack by which Satan gets into the church. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. It's interesting, uh, Jim's comment earlier, and, and he had no idea what I'm preaching on, but, you know, about the football game and about the, the guys tackling each other and hitting each other, right, you know. And, and, and yeah, that's supposed to be football, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I enjoy it, you know. <laughs> I used to play football as a, when I was just a bit younger, maybe a year ago, you know. It's just... <laughs> um, But you know, that kind of mindset should be in the Christian that, no, no, no. We want to treat everybody with love and kindness and peace. That's what we're to do, right? That's what we're to do. You know, and um, there were times when we we were were sitting watching the football game and, and, of course, you know, the teenagers use that as a, as a hangout, you know. You probably ask them the score and they wouldn't know because they're just, you know, hanging out. Um, and they would come and stand in front of us, right? I'm like, I think Rick's out there somewhere, you know. <laughs> but you know what I did not do? I did not get up and push them out of the way and say, hey, you're interrupting my, you know, my enjoyment. Because we are the carriers of peace, right? 
Does that inconvenience us at times? Sure. Does the world look at us and say, you know what? You should, you should strike back. Yeah. But Jesus says, no, no, no. You know, one of the most amazing things in Scripture to me is when Jesus is being beaten, when he's being spit on and ridiculed and nailed to the cross, it said he spoke not a word. Right? He, just, he just gave himself up for you and for me. That's peace. Right before Jesus goes to the cross, in fact, he prays this in John chapter 17. I do not pray for these alone, but for also for those who believe in me through their word. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent. You see, being peacemakers is not a job. It's a reflection of God to our world. When someone says something that offends you, choose peace. When, some, when you get overlooked for something that you didn't do or that you did in church and you got overlooked for it, choose peace. When you don't like the choice of chairs or pews, choose peace. Whoops, maybe it went too far on that one. <laughs> right? Choose peace. Because that's the Jesus we serve. If you aren't happy with every little aspect of the service or you don't like the preaching, well, you're lost forever. But if you don't like it, choose peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, antagonism is the world's way, right? And you may be thinking, but pastor, I won't get. Yeah, because this is temporary. Our reward is waiting for us in heaven, right? Well, let's look at the readiness this morning. When we put shoes on, it's for us to be ready to move, right? God fits our feet, equips us so that we take action, right? Take action. Brought. These are my sneakers. They're smooth on the bottom. <laughs> They're not supposed to be smooth on the bottom. What's the problem? It's because I use them, right? We're to be fitted to be ready to move in the spiritual, right? We're to be ready for action. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. You know, there are, there are times when I'm at home with my shoes off relaxing and one of you comes to the door uh, to our door needing to get into the church. So I go over in my sock feet or in my bare feet to unlock the door of the church for you, right? Not an easy thing to do. In fact, it hurts sometimes. <laughs> but sometimes Christians do that, don't we? We try to go out into this battle, this spiritual battle with the devil, with no shoes on. It's gonna hurt. Right? So what actions are we to we be fitted for? Number one, or letter A, we are to stand our ground. We're fitted to stand our ground. Paul tells us, stand firm with the feet fitted, right? With your feet just totally equipped. The, sold, the soldier's shoes dug in and did not allow them to be pushed back. We stand on the promises of God. We stand by faith in who Jesus Christ is. There is no other name under heaven by which we are saved. We 
We need to stand on that. You know, and when we deny the truth, to blend in, to fit in, to make life easier, we're not standing, we're retreating. Right? And I've said it before, I don't think I've said it here in sermons, but in Pennsylvania I've had, Christians need to stop being wimpy. Paul doesn't say try to make it. He says, stand firm right? on the word of God that we're given. We're fitted to stand our ground. Number two, we're fitted to take new ground. We're fitted to take new ground. Those soldiers that I was talking about when they put those nails in there, they weren't just to stand firm. They were so that they could push the enemy out of the way and move forward. Take new ground, right? John Wesley used to ask at his small group meetings this simple question, are you closer to God today than you were when we last met? If not, why not? Because we're to grow, we're to take ground, we're to move forward, folks. Not be stagnant. You don't win by just standing there, do we? Take new ground. And then the third way that we are to be ready is to seed the ground. We're to seed the ground. Readiness for Paul also refers to the idea that believers should be ready to go and spread the gospel message, the gospel of peace. We're the ones who are go and spread, right? Go and make a difference. Isaiah, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, God reigns. When is the last time you told somebody in the world, God is alive? And he is active in my life. Right. First Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Be ready. Be fitted. So that when people say, why in the world are you such a peaceful person? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. Right? You know, we're surrounded by a world that needs the answers that we have. That need the hope that we have. That need the peace that we have. And yet, for so many of us, while the world outside is turning further and further from God, we sit with our shoes off. Do you know it's estimated that 95% of Christians will never share their faith with another person? 95% of us will never share the message of Jesus. And now, don't get me wrong, we don't need to cram our beliefs down anyone's throat. I am absolutely not advocating. In fact, it kind of gets on my nerves when you see somebody on a box on the corner yelling and screaming about Jesus, right? Because it's not a representation of Jesus. So I'm not advocating cramming our beliefs down anyone's throat. That does no good. We do, however, need to be ready and willing to talk about Jesus. He saved you. If you were pronounced with a disease and said you only had a week to live, and then a doctor came by and healed you. Man, you talk about that doctor forever. Guess what? Jesus came by and healed you. Kept you from death. Gave you life. We need to talk about that. And God will provide the opportunities. You don't have to make this up. God will bring people across your path who you can share with. 
Now, is every moment a, I want to know if you're going to pray the prayer of salvation? No. But every moment is an opportunity just to talk about our Lord Jesus. Right? For many of us, it's time to stop going barefoot. Or time to buy new shoes. <laughs> right? What initially brought you to church? Look at these numbers. <clears throat> One to two people were evangelized. In other words, they were saved and then brought to church. One to two percent. Two to three percent liked a program that the church offered, so they came. Three percent were attracted by a small group a study, Sunday school, whatever it may be, right? 4% had a need met by the church. Only 4% come to church because they've had a need met. 6 to 8% walked in by their own initiative. And this study is a few years old. That number is dropping quickly with each year that passes. 10% like the pastor. My goodness, we got to work on that one, don't we? <laughs> 10% came because they liked the pastor. 70 to 85% of people who walked through the doors of a church came because of an invitation by a friend or a relative. You get the picture? Be ready. Have your feet ready. I wonder, now don't raise your hands because you'll give me a stroke. I wonder how many of us here today invited somebody to church this, to come with them this morning. All right? I wonder how many of us. Oh, but you know... There are other ways for people to come to church, not according to that. 70 to 85% people come by the invitation of a friend or a relative, right? wonder how many of us, just today, just this past week, said, would you come to church with me? And you say, well, pastor, I've tried that before. Well, it's okay, do it again. And again and again, right? Because how else would they know how important God is unless you are persistent, right? Some of you don't know, but um, I'm a typical man. I hate going to the doctor. Sorry, Dr. Odette, but you know. <laughs> I hate going to the doctor. And sometimes the only time I go to the doctor is when Karen has pushed me several times. Several times. If she stopped after one, oh, Dave, you need to go to the doctor, I wouldn't have gone. Invite people to church. Invite them again. Invite them again. They need to see how important it is in your life. You see, we defeat the devil, we change our world by introducing people to Jesus. Christians kind of have, have gotten that mixed up. We think if we support a certain candidate for office, then the world's going to change. It's not. We think if we get certain laws in place, then the world's going to change. It's not. Do you know something? I haven't, well, I haven't met too many criminals, but if I haven't met a criminal who said, oh, I better not do that. It's against the law. Right? We change the world by having Jesus change lives. That's the readiness of the gospel of peace. So are you ready? Are you fitted with the gospel of peace. You know what? 
It's time to put our shoes on and go. This, by the way, is a picture of a genie in England. Um, <laughs> pointing at Angelia. And <laughs> it's time. It's time to say, let's go. Let's carry God with us to our world. Stand as we close in prayer. Amen.